Hey everybody, uh, I'm Gabe and we have Sandy Tice with us uh, this week. You want to introduce yourself? I'm Sandy Tice, I run Progress Ohio and I'm on the NARAL board. Cool. Uh, and our executive director Kelly Copeland's with us. Hi, I hired Gabe. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we won't hold that And recruited you. Sandy. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we just got back from the State House. Uh, we had an event. Uh, do you want to talk a little bit about what the event was and why it was necessary? Yes, um, we had a very successful press conference um, talking about the dangerous rhetoric that really started ramping up um, uh, this summer after the release of the very widely discredited and, and heavily edited videos about um, Planned Parenthood. And, um, you know, we'd seen an increase in rhetoric before that, but once those videos came out, um, the comments from politicians and anti-choice groups just really I think were uh, at an all-time high or at least um, kind of how they were in 2009 before the assassination of Dr. Tiller. Right. Um, we had all been really frankly very concerned and then as, as everyone knows there was a tragic shooting um, on uh, Black Friday at uh, Planned Parenthood in Colorado Springs where three people were, were killed and many others were injured. And so what we were talking about today was how that has been a cycle over time from the anti-choice movement to con to increase their rhetoric, to include inflammatory things like saying, um, you know, people are getting away with murder, that they're selling baby parts, all, all sorts of really inflammatory and insightful, you know, inciting violence type of um, comments. And then, you know, we see someone take matters into their own hands and commit violence. And so we really wanted to call that out and talk about some, some solutions that we think are are needed right yeah uh, it's definitely a, a cycle that continues um, you had an op-ed uh, in the Columbus Dispatch uh, on Saturday um, talking about this cycle uh, the op-ed was opposed um, by Mike Anadakis for Ohio right to life writing mm -hmm. on the other side of the page uh, and his response was more rhetoric yeah, he, he didn't actually take the opportunity um, to, you know, acknowledge that they have said things that, that frankly, they shouldn't, that right. they have made false allegations. What he did is he repeated those fa false allegations um, against Planned Parenthood and other, uh, other abortion providers. And, you know, frankly, I think that's what his intent was all along. Um, you know, after Dr. Tiller was assassinated in uh, 2009, um, like anti-choice groups really kind of pulled back a little bit on that rhetoric. I think there was an acknowledgement that it, at least if they didn't feel resp partially responsible for what happened, they felt that it was politically unwise right. to continue, you know, calling abortion doctors murderers and, you know, those sorts of things. Um, frankly, this time they have doubled down, and that's exactly what we saw in the op-ed from Mike Gonadakis, and it was it was very disappointing. I, I expected better of him, frankly. Yeah. Not only did they double down, but I think we've seen things with this one that we haven't seen before. Everybody who wants to be the leader of the free world on the Republican side has come out and amplified the discredited information that was in those videos. They continue to talk about the sale of baby parts and all that mm -hmm. other kind of stuff. And I've never seen right. the political heavyweights weigh in in this way, which is what I think is empowering these people who are prone to violence anyway. Do you think that's because they're trying to <laughs> knock off the big mouth at the the top of the uh, if, if you top of the if pile? you want to win a Republican primary, you pretty much have to be a wholly owned subsidiary of the right to life movement. Right. And so every one of them is trying to outdo each other. And then we have the woman in the scene, Carly Fiorina, who made up a story about what's in that Planned Parenthood video, right. the anti Planned Parenthood complete video. fabrication, complete fabrication. And the one thing that just blows me away is there's a a picture of a fetus in there that they say was aborted. It was a photograph that a woman had taken of her stillborn and put on her Facebook page. How mm -hmm. do you think she feels when she sees yeah. that? And they took that without permission. Yeah. I mean, these people, they need to quit calling themselves pro-life. Right. So we're seeing it from Carly Fiorino, um, but also John Kasich was repeating it. Um, we've talked in previous episodes about how he was in New Hampshire um, mentioned, you know, this sale of body parts and the crowd shouted him down saying, no, that's not right. true. Um, that hasn't stopped him from saying it. 
Right. Keith Faber testified uh, on this. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, this no more body parts is the phrase that this shooter in Colorado was quoted as repeating. Um, I know after the videos had come out, uh, you and I talked about, you know, somebody's going to get killed. We were saying this months ago. Yeah, yeah we were. Um, but yet here's Faber testifying about it. Um, and Ohio Right to Life uh, making all of these statements, just, you know, any opportunity they can to continue uh, talking about their version of what they think that these videos represent. Um, it just, you know, it keeps going on. And the fact that there's a, a police officer and an Iraqi war veteran and a mother who are now dead, uh, they don't really seem to take too much concern about that. Well, you know, I mean, they've, they've, you know, given the obligatory platitudes of, you know, they're, they're horrified by the acts of violence and, you know, their thoughts and prayers, but, you know, talk is cheap um, right. when it comes to those sorts of things. When, when you're not examining your role in this, um, when you're, you're saying things that are repeated by someone who went out and killed a bunch of people, um, you ought to maybe pull back a little bit, at least at least take, you know, some stock of what you said and, you know, should you still be saying that? And these groups are doubling down. And, you know, we have a, um, a group um, that works with Ohio Right to Life called Created Equal. Um, uh, some of our um, listeners may know them around town as the people with the, the big, you know, um, graphic pictures over right. um, highways and on uh, trucks and on college campuses. Well, they, high school campuses. High school college, high school campuses as well. Yes, thank yeah. you for the correction. And, Everywhere. you know, they have been targeting um, physicians in Columbus and Dayton with a campaign that they call Killers Among Us. And, you know, you would think that after we called that out in the op-ed, you know, they would dial it back and they sent out an email to their supporters and I'm reading from it. It says, we will investigate your daily decapitation, dismembering and disemboweling of little boys and girls. Um, you know, these are, these are groups who intend for people to take their words and do something about them. That that's the only explanation that right. I can have that, you know, after they've, there's been an act of violence, you know, I, after, you know, they've been called out on it and for them to double down like they have at groups like Created Equal and Ohio Right to Life and other anti-choice groups. My, my only conclusion is that you know that they tacitly condone this violence yeah. i think they i think they think they get away from it get away from it because you know they're not the ones pulling the trigger but they're certainly the ones poisoning the mind that does and, right. and even the ones who have pulled the trigger after the fact oftentimes have called it justifiable homicide yeah have you seen that in news articles over and over and over again and it is terrorism because you know in the case of dr tiller um you can't tell me that the that the assassin gunning him down in his church wasn't intended to be a message right. to all of us who right. support reproductive rights that, hey, you're not even safe in your church. Um, when that happened back in 2009, I got a call from my pastor and he said, hey, um, you know, and not that I've ever felt um, targeted as, you know, as a group from NARAL, we're not abortion providers and that at least until now hasn't been um, a group of people that have been targeted. But, you know, my pastor was worried about my safety. And he says, well, you know, if we have to hire a bodyguard so you can come to church, that's what we're going to do. Wow. Um, that's terrorism. Yeah. I, I was glad today at the press conference the lawmakers called it domestic terrorism. Because yeah. that's what it is. Representative Michelle Lepore Hagan used the word terrorism. Yes. Um, and she was there uh, not only to oppose the, uh, the violent rhetoric, uh, but also as one of two main sponsors um, – her and uh, Representative Stephanie House uh, were there today to unveil House Bill 408. Uh, this bill gives uh, two new tools to people who are subject to harassment. Um, it allows abortion clinic staff to file civil lawsuits mm -hmm. uh, against people who are harassing them so that after they've documented this, uh, the harassment that takes place by protesters outside of facilities, now they have legal recourse. Uh, and uh, secondly, it creates a new buffer zone 
um, a 15 foot radius outside of abortion clinic entrances that uh, protesters will not be able to enter, uh, making sure that people have unobstructed access to the clinics. Mm -hmm. um, it's interesting at the Colorado shooting, we learned that Planned Parenthood Colorado had a safe room in their clinic. How sad is it that a healthcare provider has to have a safe room right. in case some in case they're attacked in this way? Yeah. Right. Well, and as um, uh, many people know, our Cleveland office is in an abortion clinic, um, and there are a lot of safety protocols. And certainly after the the shootings in Colorado, um, you know, those were reexamined. And you know, I'm not going to get into um, what happens there because you know keeping that private is part of keeping the preterm staff and our staff safe. Right. Um, but, you know, um, I had to call our interns. I had to call our new staff and say, hey, do you feel safe coming to work? You know, do you need to talk about anything? And, uh, you know, I, one of our um, former interns, she had written a piece that was on um, Facebook. Uh, Connie Schultz picked it up. Mm -hmm. And she talked about how I had called her once and told her not to come in back in 2007 because we'd had a bomb threat. I've been through this so many times. I didn't even remember that. Oh, wow. I didn't even remember that. And that, right. that really kind of hit home with me. I'm like, <laughs> how many times? As Columbus's tornado siren test goes on. It's Wednesday um, at noon. What are you going to do? But, you know, and we have drills. Right. At preterm. Um, we had one not too long ago. Actually, before the shooting, we had one, um, you know, for, for emergencies. And, you know, how many times are we going to have to go through this? And what's i think what's great about representative house and representative lapore hagan introducing this legislation is that it can provide a legal mechanism for the doctors who have been targeted um not just abortion providers but even doctors who are signing backup agreements to allow abortion providers to remain open it gives them a way to without having to put their name on the legal document mm -hmm. to to bring a civil lawsuit um, and that's really important because it helps them to maintain their safety. Right. You know, the, these groups, they go out there and they put their names and their addresses, their home addresses, not just their work addresses out there, um, you know, with a little disclaimer, a little wink and a nod saying, oh, we don't, we don't support violence. Well, then why are you giving out their home address? Right. What, what do you think, what do you want to happen? Um, you know, so I think that's very good. I also think that the buffer zone, um, they did a great job of crafting that so that it would be, um, it would be constitutional. Right. Um, as we know, there was a case out of Boston that was struck down, um, which really kind of ticked us off because, of course, the Supreme Court has a buffer zone. Yeah, they love their <laughs> um, buffer zone. So, um, yeah, theirs was okay, but uh, the one in Boston wasn't. So um, representatives, uh, House and Lepore Hagan, they crafted theirs after the one in New York. And we believe that if it's passed, it would stand. It, you can restrict somebody's conduct without restricting their speech legally. That's right. And right. Cincinnati learned that. Cincinnati's always been at the heart of the abortion wars, and they were the first city that passed one, had it go all the way up to the Supreme Court and pass constitutional muster. And the judge, uh, Thomas Crush, who issued that initial order, was the top vote getter every election cycle afterwards. The public huh. is on our side. This is Cincinnati. This is home of right. Jack Wilkie and all those other people. Um, so I think the public recognizes the need for this. And I think there's a, even if this bill isn't going to go anywhere because of who's in charge, I think it's important to draw attention to the severity of the problem right. and put the people on notice who are doing it that we're not going to stop. Right. Uh, you mentioned Cincinnati. I know that there's a history there. Can you speak to that? Yeah. It, uh, history's repeating itself. Um, there was a speech, an anti-choice rally outside the Margaret Sanger Center in Cincinnati about 30 years ago. And uh, three days later, that clinic and a related clinic in Cincinnati were firebombed. And at the time, Planned Parenthood officials went out and they said they believed there was a link between the fiery rhetoric at the rally and the firebombing. And of course, the anti-choice folks made fun of them and said, oh, they're trying to restrict our rights again. Well, we know that there was a link because the man who did the bombings talked about it in a prison diary that he'd written. His name wow. is John Brockhoft. Uh, he was in prison in Florida for bombing some clinics down there. And he talked about attending the rally and how he felt so strongly about what he heard and that he knows that God doesn't like people who are tame. He wants, you know, God wants people who are powerful and strong. And so he decided he needed to do something to show God just what kind of guy he was. And so he firebombed the clinics. Um, 
so it's interesting that when we say that there's a link, they dismiss us, but one of the guys who actually did the violence pointed out there is a link. And then when he was released, um, Janet Reno was the attorney general, Ed Sargas, who's now a federal judge, was the U.S. attorney. And they made public comments about, uh, they defended the new restrictions that they put on him when he was paroled. He wasn't allowed to associate with any of the anti-choice groups again, and he wasn't allowed to live within a certain radius of the clinics. And they went on the record and said, we did this because we know sometimes he just can't help himself. Jeez. So at the top, top level of law enforcement, they acknowledged that there's triggers for people like this and that the public needs to be protected from them. Well, and then he was interviewed a couple of years ago. Yeah. And he was asked by a reporter, uh, you know, do you regret this? And he was like, no. No, I don't regret it. And he talked about having continued association with um, other people who had been convicted of clinic violence through the Army of God. Well, and, and Robert Deere, the man who was responsible for the Colorado shootings, he was a fan of the Army of God. And that comes from a New York Times piece that quoted one of his ex-wives saying that he was a big fan of them. So these people find each other, they inspire each other. Well, and they don't have to go to events. You know, with social media now, um, we know groups from, you know, the Ku Klux Klan to, to ISIS to you name it. You know, they're, they are reaching people through the Internet. Um, they are connecting through the Internet, and we're seeing the same thing through these anti-choice groups. They're seeing this rhetoric, um, you know, on Facebook and Twitter and other places. Um, they don't have to be a member of an organization or ever have attended a rally like in the past to hear this stuff. It's out there on the Internet, and they can, they can find it, and they're continuing to hear it, and from people as high up as running for president. Right. And, you know, that, I think, really adds to... Um, the danger of it, frankly, you know, I think, I think we used to kind of have this idea that, you know, it was, it was mainly these fringe people who were saying this stuff. The governor of Ohio says this stuff. Right. Um, and he purports to be a moderate. Of course, we all at NARAL Pro Choice Ohio and Progress Ohio know that that's <laughs> baloney. Um, but he purports to be a moderate. And, you know, so that really makes this, I think, in the minds of, of people who feel like they have to take matters into their own hands, make this feel more mainstream and more more credible. Well, there used to also be a divide between the anti-choice groups that promote violence like Operation Rescue, they have the wanted posters, and Right to Life. And right. we're not seeing that divide anymore. We're seeing them all singing out of the same hymn book of violence, which is also kind of frightening. Well, and, you know, they protest together. They do things at the state house together. They're, your point is well taken there. They don't, they don't maintain that, you know, veil of... Um, of separation that they used to. They're, you know, they're hand in glove with each other. I mean, it's very clear that they're working hand in glove out in Dayton. You know, Ohio Right to Life works with the governor to create these restrictions that abortion clinics can't possibly meet because, of course, they keep changing them. And then Created Equal just so happens to do a Killers Among Us harassment campaign to the very people that the clinic needs to recruit to, you know, sign agreements to take care of patients if that's needed. Um, you can't tell me that's not coordinated because, right. I mean, it was the exact perfect timing. They're not that lucky. They're coordinating and they're using insightful, uh, you know, they're using language that incites violence and, and they're doubling down on it even after the Colorado shooting. And I think um, one of the things I wanted to, as we've been kind of thinking about this stuff and researching this, that I was really, um, I would really direct people to look at is a piece that was written by um, Reverend Rob uh, Shank. Um, he used to protest outside of clinics, um, the one where uh, Dr. Barnett Slapian um, had practiced. And after Dr. Slapian was um, assassinated in his home by a sniper through his kitchen window in front of his wife and one of his children, after he just got home from, I believe it was his own father's funeral, um, mm -hmm. Uh, Dr. Um, uh, uh, Reverend Shank um, sent um, some flowers and a note. He'd put them at a makeshift uh, memorial. And uh, Mrs. Slapian said it back and basically was like, um, you don't get to do that because your rhetoric played a role in what happened. And, you know, he talks about in this Time article that, you know, at first 
you know, he resisted that idea. You know, he didn't accept it. But over time, he came to understand that he did have a role in that. And, um, you know, as a person of faith, um, you know, he talks about how he'd done a lot of soul searching and how, um, you know, at this point when he's talking about it, you know, he views it as a form of confession. And, you know, he talks about how, you know, anti-choice activists really have to examine the, un even if they're unintended consequences of their overheated rhetoric. And he, you know, he quotes several sections of the Bible that talk about how words are powerful and how words can be dangerous and how they shouldn't be used as weapons against other people. I would really encourage people to read this piece, especially um, any of our opponents who are using this language who might be listening to this podcast. Um, it's not too late right. to stop inciting violence. That's the first I've seen of somebody who actually did incite the violence admitting there is a link between the rhetoric and, the and being sorry about it, yeah. unlike um, the the fire bomber out of Cincinnati who is not at all sorry. No. Right. Okay. Well, and, and I think the they, they made some noise today about how the, the law is unconstitutional. How many unconstitutional anti-choice bills have been introduced? And that First we're, of all, this and that we're paying Attorney General DeWine to uh, yeah. defend yeah. in court. Um, but, you know, unlike them, we actually respect the law. And, uh, you know, the advocates that we work with did their homework, and they introduced legislation that is not unconstitutional, but that actually could help protect people and is a real solution to a real problem. And if anybody uh, wants to call their local legislator and ask them to support this bill, that would be great. It's always nice when the lawmakers hear from the public. Um, I think there are more of us, the other side's just louder and a little more tightly wound, so they'll do things we won't do. Okay. Um, if you call your legislator, it's House Bill 408. There'll be information at prochoiceohio.org. Um, we'll put the links to the Time article and Kelly's terrific op-ed uh, in the show notes. Uh, and we'll see everybody next week. Bye. Thank you.